Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this. Uh, I think it's the final yes. seminar in the series before the parliamentary recess. My name is Martin Doherty Hughes. I'm the uh, Member of Parliament for West Dumbartonshire. I'm delighted to be joined by the panel this evening, as well as the advisory board members. And we'll go into that in just a wee moment. But if I could ask, all, first of all, Dr. Uh, Brigitte Anderson uh, to say a few words uh, on behalf of Big Innovation Centre and, of course, our sponsors. Brigitte, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Uh, well, first, I want to say it's very exciting uh, evening tonight because we're going to discuss data governance and blockchain. Uh, I want to say also that we have a different here on the uh, specialist panel tonight. We are represented by uh, academia, uh, by uh, business and entrepreneurship, uh, by uh, regu the regulatory bodies, uh, European Union, uh, and uh, so international organizations, and of course also a law firm. So we'll get all the perspectives on data governance and blockchain. There's one <coughs> more thing I want to say. And uh, of course, this year is the last uh, evidence session before summer. Uh, but it does not stop here. Uh, we will, in the next uh, uh, few weeks, a uh, couple of weeks, three weeks, uh, launch a major digital platform for the blockchain community who have all engaged online or engaged in parliament. And that platform, everyone who is attending this meeting, other meetings will receive an invite. And you basically just need to opt in. And there you can become a user uh, of the platform and we can all interact on the platform which will have all event postings all video recordings from all past meetings the photo galleries from all past meetings and our press uh, 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 which we've had lots of there will be a um, kind of a, a wall which we can all post comments on for the meetings and a lot more so really, I'm looking forward to the next phase in the APPD blockchain, which will become more platform oriented in terms of user engagement and participation. And I'm sure that uh, um, uh, Marty will also mention you clearly one day, uh, soon we'll be back in parliament, but we will still have some online presence on the platform. Um, the last thing I want to say uh, is, I'll go back to the meeting tonight. This is, um, very interesting. So when we're discussing data governance, uh, it is really on blockchain, very closely related to network governance. And one of the major aspects uh, in the kind of in the second digital revolution uh, is, of course, uh, technology is not centralized. So is the data going to be centralized or is the way in which that can be um, avoided. There's no point in decentralized technology if all the data sits in one place, which we have seen a lot in the first uh, digital revolution. So that would become very interesting. Also the governance and regulation, where does it sit? Is it governing the network? Is it government regulation? Is it about international standards? Uh, is it about corporate governance and ethics? Or is it really about the individual sources who own the individual data? So all this, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more on uh, tonight. So I look forward and I'll hand back to Martin. Thank you. And yes, there's a lot to look forward to across even uh, the recess or the summer period as well. Uh, and uh, without further ado, because I know we're all, uh, some of you are in different timelines and people in early mornings, late evenings, uh, and we're going to go straight in. Uh, we're you know, glad to welcome Dr. Enrico Rossi. Who is a fellow of LSC, London School of Economics, uh, and a research fellow in the Department of Computer Science, uh, where he focuses on the modeling and theorization of digital interfaces. Uh, he has developed and co created and currently leads on the LSE course on crypto assets and blockchain. And Enrico, I think you'll be presenting on the reconsidering dualities and dualisms in data and governance. And as a bit of a theory freak, um, I'm looking forward to this. So uh, without further ado, over to you. So yeah, so my, my talk will be a little bit uh, introdu introducing some theoretical concepts and then I will solutions for regulators with respect to how to interpret and approach data governance over the blockchain. So um, the typical governance problems with the blockchain 
is usually framed in terms of transparency versus privacy. And the rise, uh, as Brigitte also said, from the very well-known fact that blockchain is a decentralized technology. Um, so usually our regulatory problems uh, that are also linked to the application of the D uh, GDPR to blockchain uh, derive from the fact that blockchain is decentralized. So the question here is, what does decentralization mean and how this can be relevant for regulation of data governance? Uh, so one way to address this problem is to understand that blockchain can be decomposed in two dimensions. So there are various ways to define these two dimensions. Usually you've got a dimension of access versus a dimension of consensus that are also sometimes called as, as off-chain, on-chain, uh, or as storage versus manipulation if we want to uh, use by the um, GDPR. Um, so I'm not sure, yeah. So um, what, I'm, what I would like to uh, argue is that usually the way in which these two dimensions are treated is to separate them in order to regulate governance, the data governance over the blockchain. So you usually you store data off-chain, which remain personal data. And you, what you do on-chain, you actually process or manipulate some form of data, metadata or encrypted data um, or derived data. And in this way, usually uh, you tend to avoid the problems deriving from the fact that over the blockchain, it's, it is seemingly very hard to keep data personal and at the same time guarantee privacy. So what I would like to argue is that uh, this doesn't necessarily work and the way in which you can see that, the, that things are much more complex than that is to uh, frame these dual dimensions of the blockchain as two different logical layers. And there are two examples that can be discussed uh, that illustrate the importance of the layer stack. Um, so for instance, for permissionless blockchain, it is very well known that uh, you've got three different layers. You've got an infrastructural transmission layer where data is accessed and stored. You've got a protocol or consensus layer where data is validated and manipulated. And you've got an application or service layer where data are used, exploited, and valued. Now, what, what the standard way to address regulatory problem and, and privacy over the blockchain would say is you store data off-chain at the infrastructure layer, and then you manipulate on-chain some form of encrypted data. In this way, you solve uh, the privacy conundrum. The problem is that as the students of crypto assets very well known, the actual nature, meaning, and value of the data that you store off-chain directly depend on the way in which data are manipulated on-chain. So it's not a one-way uh, logical connection, but you also have feedback loops. So from the way in which data are manipulated to the meaning of data that are stored off-chain, even though you don't breach anything and you keep everything encrypted. So one way to solve this, I would argue, is to merge antitrust law with regulatory insights. So antitrust law on chain, so making sure that the actors operating at one layer of the logical stack do not have too much market power or validating power to affect, merge this with the regulatory insight that regulators already apply. Uh, one other interesting example to uh, understand the relevance of this layered approach is when you've got so-called permission or proprietary blockchain. Um, so in this case, you actually have a fourth layer, uh, which is a platform layer that sits between the consensus layer, let's say, and the application layer. And so this platform layer is usually centralized. And, uh, and the interesting aspect uh, of this multi-layer configuration is that there are usually two different tokens. One token that is conferred to the various actors and define their status, and another token that is manipulated on chain, let's say. So what, what this platform layer does is usually, usually it connects a backend with a frontend, 
or a cloud system with a dashboard. And usually there is no need at this point to focus on antitrust law, such as for a closure across layers in this case, because you can just focus on the platform layer. And there are various examples consistent with this type of four layers configuration where just focusing on the platform layer is enough. So I, I wrote down three examples we have been studying, such as the identity management of the German Federal Office Migration and Refugees, where the platform layer consists of privacy services linked to the dashboard at the front end, and data stored and distributed off-chain and therefore remain private. Or in the well-known trade lens case of Myers, which is one of the most uh, um, famous example of supply chain, uh, the platform layer is linked to the cloud system of IBM uh, that releases access token and with the system management that releases bearing tokens. These, uh, these are the two tokens. So the platform layer enables or restricts access to data and defines and enforces data sharing rules. Uh, so data is made available to the participants according to the role the participants performs in a given event. A third example, for instance, uh, which I think is very interesting, is the one of management of compensations and rewards in the media industry. Um, in this case, there are various startups that identify two different classes of users, usually called signature users and non-signature users. Uh, they have different rights and duties with respect to access to the full content of data. You usually have, once again, two tokens, uh, one token is a non-fungible token and defines the status of the actor. The other is a fungible token and symbolizes the, the actual compensations or rewards that each actor uh, can claim. And so in, um, in many other cases, uh, you've got this configuration. So in this case, differently from the permissionless case, this extra layer allows you to actually uh, exercise some control on the way in which data is uh, managed and governed on chain and you do not necessarily have to resort to antitrust market power practices which in the case of permissionless would be necessary. So my takeaway and I'm going to conclude uh, can be summarized as follows. Uh, what I'm trying to argue is that in order to understand data governance over the blockchain you do not necessarily have to identify the two dimensions of the blockchain. So the dimension of access and data storage and the dimension of data manipulation as even the GDPR uh, legislation does. But it's important to reframe the dual nature of this problem uh, in terms of logical layers. And what is really important is to see how these logical layers of the technology stack influence each other because they cannot be kept separate as it seems that a lot of legislation and literature assumes. Uh, so the problem that has to be understood is how different layers influence each other and different tokens, what I always say to my students, different tokens, the meaning of different tokens is, are linked and acquire meanings from the logical layer they belong to. Uh, as we saw in the example, so you've got different tokens based on where the actor is located and, 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 the, and the operations that the actor performs across these layers. Um, so what has to be regulated when dealing with data governance are the logical layers and their interfaces, so their interconnections, and not the single elements, standalone elements uh, of the network. Uh, so that is my conclusion, and uh, I'm open for further discussion later. That's great, Enrico. Thank you very much. There's a lot of food for thought there. And we're, we're going to speed on ahead. And I'm delighted also that uh, Mohamed Tanoli is with us as well. Uh, and he's the head of blockchain research and development and consumer node. And uh, he's been at the cutting edge of blockchain technologies and data governance. He's a founder of the consumer node, a decentralized data governance network based on distributed ledger technology. And he's going to present on decentralized data governance and rights over data approach. Uh, over to you, sir. I put some slides together to, um, to just go through and explain. And uh, so my basically approach is uh, in context, uh, GDPR, um, data governance under GDPR and how, what can be done and how the decentralized model um, can achieve the GDPR objectives. So um, 
looking at the, the data governance, uh, so the first thing we need to look at the data value chain. So what data, um, uh, what are the stages and the, the modules? So uh, <clears throat> we can look at the collection, storage and aggregation, processing and analysis, use and monetization. So this is the data value chain. Now, um, so uh, the blockchain decentralized model, uh, when we talk about the blockchain decentralized model, we are talking about uh, a model which is based on the transparency um, and, and we can see that into the public network where, where, where the data is posted in the form of uh, public keys and the transactions. Uh, if you look at the use cases, which are um, uh, the Bitcoin and uh, the Ethereum, they are the public networks. Uh, basically is the technology use cases. So most of the people confuse with the, uh, with, with the blockchain, with Bitcoin, when it's come to the regulation, but it's, it's the implementation of the technology at public level. So uh, the public network uh, deals with the public keys and transactional data. So th those keys, um, if they identify a natural person, then they, they come under GDPR. Um, but there are uh, hashing and, uh, and cryptography which can be utilized uh, to secure those keys. And then, then they have transactional data. That data is basically, that can be any crypto asset data or that can be any other data, which, which is, for example, any document data or anything which, which can be posted on the, on the ledger. Now, if you look at the, 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 the public uh, network uh, use cases, we are talking about processor controllers and users. Now, the confusing thing in the public network is that sometimes the user act as a controller and sometimes the users being considered as a processor because if I am uh, transferring a crypto assets from my address to another address, then I am a controller because I know what I'm doing. Uh, so in that capacity, I'm a controller. So the definition is a bit confusing. Now, in terms of, um, if I am a node of the network, then I'm a processor, I am processing the transaction. So the tension really come um, between the GDPR and the public network at a stage where we are talking about data minimization and uh, data limitation and the processing of data. So at the public network, if, if we are talking about regulating public network, then we are talking about the regulation itself cannot be implemented on the network level. It's based on the use case. So who is the owner? So currently the public network owned by uh, the ownership is basically, um, it, it's no one. So there's, and they are everywhere. So we can say that um, the, the current uh, uh, public networks, they are, they, uh, they're just uh, being uh, uh, implemented um, for a specific use case um, for the crypto assets. Now, one of the, uh, the, the main thing which we are focusing today and my presentation is that transparency and privacy. So if before we go to the next slide, I would like to just share that this decentralized model in the public network created a transparency of transaction processing and uh, the identities, which are the public keys. Now this, this provide us and give us a new um, idea that how this transparency can be used uh, between the organization when it's come to data sharing between uh, business to business and business to consumer. Now, if we look at the current centralized models, this is what's happening. At the collection level, we can see the data brokers, they are collecting a lot of attributes of our personal data, including our name, addresses, and there's a lot which, which is happening in the background we are not aware of. And the smart apps which we are using, there are many libraries, they track our data, they collect our data without our knowledge. So that's, that's what's happening on the collection level. If we look at the storage and aggregation, Data brokers, they use automated tools, they process data without our consent. Um, and under GDPR, uh, uh, it's our right that if something impact us, automated decision making, then um, uh, they should seek the consent of the, the data subject. Now, if we look at the processing and analysis, there is a lot happening. There are many fines going on in the, in the EU um, uh, because of illegal processing. And if we look at the user monetization, um, um, then we can see that the data is being used and sometime and quite recently, the NHS records have been shared with the, in the US, uh, they're linked back to the person uh, identified. So identifiable person. So it's mean that under the centralized governance model currently, uh, which are organization centric, and they give us only front end transparency, the transparency which they talk about, we don't know, they just share us, okay, this is what we are doing, but in the background, what's happening, we have no idea. So it's mean that the current centralized governance model have lack of transparency. 
They exclude the data subject from the process uh, of data sharing, data processing. So as a result of this, we can see the fines in the EU and the UK that the companies being fined um, um, uh, in, 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 these, in these categories um, due to lack of consent, lack of transparency, illegitimate processing, data breach notification, security breaches. The biggest fine in the UK were uh, uh, the BA and the Marriott, um, uh, as they could not uh, address the security and privacy issues in their centralized uh, model where the data was being shared, processed, and there were security breaches, and the user could not be informed about those breaches and those issues. Now, if we look at this centralized model and what's happening post GDPR with these issues and fines around the data processing, then uh, we look at the decentralized nature of the, the blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology, then we come to this model that, uh, that we, we can see that uh, the distributed ledger technology can empower a governance model where uh, the data subject can be included as a part of the governance. So what's happening with my data, who has access my data, um, and the right in relation to my data can be part. So, if distributed ledger technology extended to a level where the organization, they share data, they include data subject as a part of data governance, then it will enable meaningful transparency by exposing business processes to the individual. That what's happening with my data? Who has my data? Um, and then um, it will also uh, give the organization a legitimate data sharing process. Um, the regulator, uh, the, the transactions which are being signed by the data subject to agree on something can be shared with the regulator, which will enable the accountability um, and it will also empower the user. Now, the one thing which is um, under GDPR, we have right to access um, the right to restrict processing, the right to data portability. So the right to data portability has been heavily studied in the UK and across the world. So smart data is one of the, one of the initiatives in the UK, which is talking about porting data, uh, consumer data from one organization to another organization. So uh, distributed ledger technology can automate data portability. So multi-party data, uh, uh, data portability, which can save consumer a lot of money. Can, currently, um, CMAs uh, reveal that uh, every one of us, we pay 250 pound as a loyalty penalty. So if their data is ported across sector, we can save a lot of money. So it's mean that um, our rights, if we, if the data subject could be included into the governance process, then uh, that can enable meaningful transparency by engaging the data subject as a part of the transaction, accountability through the process recording on the ledger, and uh, user empowerment uh, um, by including user to say um, uh, to have a say about their data. So then this will create a collaborative governance model. And then it will also cover the GDPR side of it because cryptography and hashing can be used and adopted to address the problems of anonymization and uh, data deletion. But if, if, the, if the data subject is included into the governance uh, model, then that will save companies millions which they are paying in fines and penalties. Um, so I will conclude that uh, to enable meaningful transparency, accountability, and user empowerment, um, distributed ledger technology can play an important role where data subject can be part of the governance, uh, a new decentralized model, uh, which can enable um, um, a new, um, which can enable um, uh, uh, companies to share data legitimately between each other uh, across sector and across border under GDPR because GDPR created legal interoperability uh, in the UK, in the EU, and the rest of the jurisdiction. And interestingly, the, all the rest of the jurisdiction in the world, majority of them, they mirrored GDPR. So the good thing will be that if you are sharing data under the subject consent, it's mean that um, uh, you can share it cross-border under GDPR. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, great, Mohammed. Again, a, a lot of food for thought there around governance and uh, GDPR, especially come January the 1st, for those of us living in the UK uh, and what that means in the post-Brexit world. But we might get to that in the question section, I think. 
So yeah. we'll just hold that. Uh, before I, um, I actually ask uh, Charles to uh, come in, I'm afraid I have to advise you that uh, Dr. Michelle Fink will not be able to join us. She's having technical issues, but she will be submitting her evidence in writing and that will either be circulated or, or posted uh, on the website, et cetera. So please do keep a, a lookout for that. That's a disappointing, but technology, it's not always it's cracked up to be sometimes. Uh, without further ado, though, can I uh, say thanks to Charles uh, Kerrigan, uh, partner at CMS Cameron uh, McKenna Narbaro Oswalang LLP, as a fintech partner at the law firm uh, based in London. Uh, the blockchain uh, industry landscape overview named Charles as a, one of the UK's leading influencers on blockchain and works in corporate finance and venture capital fundraising transactions and projects involving blockchain, digital assets, AI and automation transformation. And is going to have a, bring a vision of a law firm, of a law firm on how the current data regulations can be applied to the blockchain industry. So without further ado, uh, over to you, sir. Thanks, Martin. Um, I think this is about trade-offs. So it's a hard question for a lawyer. Um, the problem with lawyers is we like telling people what the law is. Um, and there's an issue here. We've got existing law on data protection, but we don't yet have directly applicable law on blockchain. The law on data protection didn't contemplate blockchain. So in questions on what the law is, the answer is all in the GDPR. Questions of what the law should be, uh, we don't know because we haven't thought about it yet, but that's what we're doing this evening. Um, we can make some comments. Everybody notes the inherent tension here, but why is that? Well, GDPR is concerned with limiting access to information. Blockchain is concerned with sharing information. In particular, the best use cases of blockchain are in multi-party transactions, a shared ledger. That's the point of it. Everyone can see everyone else's information. So I'd suggest that we don't try to solve the problem simply by focusing on private blockchains because we'll miss some of the great potential benefits of the technology. And there's an eye in the problem. Blockchain is good on privacy. It protects data integrity, but at heart, it's a decentralization tool. GDPR's foundation is centralized data processing. And I think attempts to reconcile those one way or another lead to a headache. And that's where we are now. Um, and that's where a lot of the commentary resides. Um, views on anonymity and pseudonymity, the applicability of data protection and privacy laws. Maybe it's okay because transaction data only references a public blockchain address that's mainly encrypted. Maybe it's not okay because methods still exist to link individuals to the public keys. Maybe it's different in different jurisdictions. It isn't all a GDPR problem. Industrial use cases don't need to store personal information necessarily. So some of the concerns could be straw man arguments, but I think we should still be concerned with the hard problem. Uh, we've been asked uh, questions and asked for proposals. Uh, these are related, but I'll take them in sequence. So I've got a next slide on the questions. Um, governments and policy makers, how do they regulate net, uh, blockchain networks? Well, to start, they can't regulate them away. Decentralized ledgers are here. And they can't be uninvented now. How can governments regulate data ownership on blockchain networks? The question, what are they trying to regulate? Governments can regulate the things that they own. That's easy to describe. Or control. That's not so easy and takes us back to issues about jurisdictional capacity. They can't regulate permissionless chains, but we can see in other contexts like money laundering that governments can regulate the entrances and exits, the part that touches the individual. And it's normally concerned with value, but it could apply equally to data. I'll come back to that. 
Uh, blockchain and GDPR, do we need new data regulation for blockchain? Uh, we might, but we should also keep in mind the technical capacity to signpost centralized data on chain while maintaining substantive data off chain. And we've been hearing about that from other speakers. Um, I'm not sure that GDPR has given citizens control of their data. Because there's a low bar to define personal information, there's also a low bar defining informed consent. And cybersecurity breaches expose data even when there is informed consent. So on to the proposals. Next slide. I've got five short points. Uh, number one, scope out the size of the problem. Do the taxonomy. Look at public and private blockchains look which have personal information and which don't. How much is each of those buckets? A properly designed system will tell you if it stores personal information. Number two, move away from theoretical debates about tracing personal information from encrypted keys. That's a long way from information that's brought up by a web search. Someone who can access encrypted data is a government or a professional or a hacker, we need different protections from them than GDPR. Number three, don't ignore the trade-offs. The tax authorities want transactions to be traceable. Number four, uh, keys are likely a route to the tokenization of personal information where access control is in the hands of the individual. In an information economy, that must be an important topic for policymakers. I'm influenced by Dave Birch's work, including the part that identity is the new money. That's true for people, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this has been true in wholesale markets for 200 years since the bank notes uh, stopped being backed by gold. The identity of the Bank of England is the old money. Uh, and finally, point five in two parts. First, do the grand theory. Do we require centralization or will we allow decentralization? If we require centralization, is that realistic in practice? People have now got a tool they can use in blockchain, so they will. I would say that we need a plan to support decentralization by being thoughtful about the harms. Who needs protection from what in that context? And the second part, also do the practical bits. Don't go around in circles and certainly don't just make work for lawyers. Lawyers look in two areas, the setup and fallout of systems. So ensure that these are managed in a way that doesn't require individuals to have a lawyer. I think there's an initial role here for regulators and standards bodies, perhaps more than legislators. Uh, system architecture and standards should be high priority. The Information Commissioner's Office work on AI can be read across and extended to blockchain. The British Standards Institution work on smart contracts likewise. The Competition and Markets Authority approach to default settings is relevant here too. So I'd like to see some work on what positive targets can be set alongside any work that we're doing on the perimeter. That's it from me. Well, that's great, sir. Thank you very much indeed. And I should have said before you started uh, that if anyone's got any questions, uh, please make sure you're putting them in the Q&A section. Um, but before I go to uh, the are people who are watching online, I'm just wondering if any of the advisory board have got any questions in terms of what we've heard so far, just to kind of start us off at all. No like solving problems associated with data privacy and blockchain deployments is, is, is great. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've, we've tackled um, uh, a lot of GDPR related issues, but I would like to turn another page. Like my question is how to assign a legal value to a blockchain powered deal. And it's also a question to Martin as well. Uh, it's like submitting a deed that uh, conveys uh, ownership or verifies like existence of an asset on a blockchain enabled operation acts as a as a, a kind of a concrete proof of like both ownership and existence of of, of, uh, of the said asset will the courts of various um, institutions accept the validity of uh, such kind of documents and when 
this is this is my question to to basically to Martin and Charles, both of them. Thank you. Charles, you can go first. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, um, I think the answer is eventually. Um, one of the um, live topics in the lockdown is the advance of digitalization, and we've all seen it, but um, we were starting from a pretty low base. So I think before uh, we're even thinking about digital assets, um, it's taken us a bit of time to um, see adoption, even of electronic signatures in certain um, industries. Uh, and uh, one of the issues there is that uh, the question of digitalization can be um, uh, one of either technology or it can be supporting regulation. And in the case of things like electronic signatures and digital assets, we've got the technology. We don't necessarily have the supporting regulation. So we run ahead of regulation. We didn't have a law that said electronic signatures are definitely valid. So we could say as lawyers and legal opinions, they are almost certainly going to be accepted by courts. But for certain conservative institutions, that wasn't good enough. For less conservative institutions have been using them for years. And I think digital assets will be the same issue. It would be good to have legislative support specifically for digital assets. But one of the things that I'm seeing is a question around adoption where there are uh, platforms and models for the issue of digital assets. The adoption from the financial institution community, though, um, is a preference for conventional assets with a digital representation. So we're going to go halfway there before we get to digital assets. Mm -hmm. And I think there are two sides to your question. One is what will the court say? And my view is the courts are pretty flexible and you've got judges who know what's going on and they will support commercial transactions. Um, the wider issue is probably that one of adoption, that some of the technology is just um, the uh, pure states of it are a bit further forward than much of the institutional community can go. And so we will make, their, make our way there perhaps in steps rather than directly in one jump. Yeah, maybe just from a legislative perspective about digital signatures is that I, I would hope, um, you know, there is movement towards that recognition of the value of it. And we would need to create trust within the ecosystem in which it exists. You know, there are already, if you uh, go to Estonia, and I'll put my cards on the table, I'm also the co-chair of the Estonia All Party Group. Uh, the Digital Signatures Act, you know, is you know, it's been around for a, a good number of years uh, and it influences a lot of people's thinking in this kind of remit. So uh, I think the main way in which Estonians have tackled this issue you know, so around, around, is also around creating trust within their own systems, first of all, uh, and allows, allows other departments, allows the legal system to gain confidence uh, in the process itself. So it's not just necessarily the technology, it's up to us to promote it and to build confidence in, in utilising it and and I think you know they, they use it to uh, to the real benefit. As Chris, uh, sorry, as Charles alluded to at the moment, we've seen digitization of services. Uh, I don't know how they, they register. For example, the registrations on deaths in uh, Scotland uh, has been a major issue during COVID nineteen, uh, and there's a huge opportunity around how you utilize digitize, digitization, but also allowing the signature to to promote that. But you need trust in the system, and as Charles alluded to again, a lot of the older conservative institutions find that very difficult. Uh, uh, so if you get one of the, the most conservative institution, for example, uh, in the UK, you have HMRC, Her Majesty's Customs and Excise. If you got them to digitize, then probably everyone else would follow in behind it because uh, they would all see that it's got value and purpose for their purse, as they would say. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's as far as I'm going to go on that one, I think. Chris, you wanted to come in as well. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that, Martin, and, and thank you to all the um, uh, 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 sessions. They're, they're very interesting and very detailed. I, I wanted to make a couple of sort of very top-level comments, if I may. Um, 
One is let's not forget why we want to use these technologies at all. They're to improve services and to improve productivity. So we're not protecting, if we're not helping people if we stop improvements to productivity and improvement to services, really. Yes, we have to protect their rights and protect them as data subjects, but let's not lose sight of it. For the vast majority of areas, these are to improve productivity and to improve both public services and, 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 and commercial services. And therefore, I wanted to repeat something, if you'll excuse the uh, take, if I'll let me take the liberty that we heard in earlier sessions, which was, I thought, a, a, a phrase we, we, we probably should always bear in mind, which was regulate the activity, not the technology. There are many areas where these things are not sensitive. And in some areas, they're behind the scenes and, and, and they're not even visible to the consumer at all. Um, construction projects don't tend to have private, private data. Um, the, the other element of that is um, two-sided. One is what we mustn't do is have a situation where regulators that need to be aware and understand this in existing, by which I mean existing regulators, they mustn't be surprised when people start using distributed ledger technology in their areas. One is because they mustn't just stop it because it doesn't satisfy them. Two, they must also recognize the benefits I can't really think of a regulatory area where they wouldn't ex wouldn't see if they knew what was going on an audit auditable immutable chain of transactions as nirvana for most of their regulatory activity. And the reason that has to be done right at the beginning is this double edged sword of immutability. It's great for auditability. It's really bad if you have to change the system because the regulator comes in late. So there's a real, real sort of um, uh, um, issue there. Um, I think many of the other ones have been there. The only one I would like to pick up on, again, coming back to this, the existing regulator must be satisfied. We must protect people, but not at the cost of not helping them. Uh, and that was just to mention one thing about the on-chain, off-chain issue. It's perfectly true that currently we use workarounds for private data, data. But one of the things you have to bear in mind when you've done that is you put all the centralization you wanted to take away links to a central data source so you can identify the data controller, which you might be able to do via consent, you might be able to do by regulatory constraint, you might be able to get a decision that it's ephemeral data, so therefore you don't really have to worry about long-term uh, uh, sensitivities. But it, it's just a plea right at the top to go back to, let's have regulatory restraint and not become the enemy. Yes, we need to discuss regulation, but we, we, we come back to this, most of the things we're talking about are already regulated. It's about ensuring the regulator understands and is satisfied by the particular application of blockchain because it's always context sensitive. Thanks, because I don't know if any of our panelists, Enrico, you want to come in and I'll bring in Brigitte here. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, and uh, following up about the distinction between activity and technology, I very much agree. However, I think that one of the fundamental problems of the blockchain is that this distinction is not very easy to draw. For a simple reason that um, blockchain technologies very often allow certain use cases and certain activities uh, because they are embedded in the way in which the technology is designed. Uh, and I think that this also is one of the driver of these uh, fundamental problems that regulators encounter with, with blockchain. So one of the, for instance, the suggestions that even the, um, from the US was, was uh, developed was to actually uh, regulate what coders and developers and programmers uh, do and, and actual lines of codes. Now, one of the reasons why they ended up trying to suggest this is that blockchain very often is, is the protocol. So what the protocol uh, allows the technology to do uh, is what the final user will be able to do. And even when, when discussing the issue of centralization and decentralization, uh, once again, it's not necessarily only a structural problem, such as the presence of intermediaries, 
such as the presence of uh, custodians holding private keys and so on and so forth. But it's also, in a sense, especially a problem of how uh, the actual technology has been designed and, and the protocol and the characteristic of the protocol running over the technology. One of the, one of the for instance, the distinction between the internet and the blockchain, I mean, there are many, but one fundamental distinction is that the internet is a general purpose technology, which means that definitely in that case, you can definitely decouple and distinguish between the infrastructure and the underlying technology and the use case. The, block, the Bitcoin blockchain, for instance, so the original blockchain is not. So it can only transact Bitcoins because Bitcoin is actually embedded in the code. So to distinguish the use case in that case from the technology and the way the, the technology is designed is very difficult. Uh, so in principle, I agree, but I also would like to, uh, to give a warning on the fact that, that the essence of this technology make this distinction a little bit more problematic. Okay, uh, Brigitte, I think you want to come in as well, yeah? Yeah, um, I also have a comment and a question. So my comment is I'm taking the very traditional economics head on here and uh, I'm relating to uh, Charles' comments on what are we trying to regulate uh, and what are we trying to achieve, something Chris Francis also um, mentioned. And from a very traditional economist hat, uh, clearly, in the old economy, it was all about regulation of mark, product markets. But then when we moved in to talk a lot more about intellectual property rights, patents, copyrights, or data, we often talk about regulation to encourage and stimulate competition. And that's something we often uh, speak about um, in the APP and AI, and we also talk about it, uh, uh, or government speak a lot about it in the relationship to intellectual property rights. We want to stimulate competition. We want to stimulate innovation. So it's not just one blockchain, but we will maybe have a lot of uh, innovation and competition on the blockchain and, and, and between blockchains. And it's of course about stimulating the ecosystems and the networks. So we want to widen networks, uh, access, um, so that we can, can become more participants. Uh, um, and of course, we have something we mentioned a lot today about the ethical areas of control and control and and um, uh, then some of the so for example uh, um, uh, Dr. Rossi you're presenting all your different layers I say four layers is better than three layers and but what's not clear to me is that what are we trying to regulate and what are we trying to achieve uh, so just a quick comment on that but I'm sure the audience have many comments Enrico if you want to come back on that quickly uh, yes, so what I wanted to highlight was, I guess, just the fact that when we would deal with digital technologies, we have to forget a little bit the old world in the sense that um, digital technology, the, one of the characteristics, the main problem characteristic of digital technology elements, they actually provide logical layers uh, that interoperate through um, interfaces. And different things occur at these different layers. Um, so what I would suggest is actually to focus on also what uh, you were referring to, Bridget, also to focus on what, what is happening at single layers and how what is happening at one layer affects the other layers. And in a sense, this comes from um, antitrust law of, of the early digital revolution. So for instance, uh, the, if we go back to the very well-known case of um, Microsoft, um, where it was uh, come down because of um, foreclosure between its operating system and the browser operating over the, the operating system. This could be seen also as, as an antitrust proceeding, looking at how what, what is happening in one layer, enabling other layers is actually affecting the performance of the other layers. And, um, and, and, and what I'm trying to say is that the key difference between open permissionless blockchain Chain and permission blockchain, very often it's just that there is one other layer. And this other layer the, is what actually allows for the centralization 
and the aggregation of stuff. Uh, it's actually an integrator or an, or an aggregator, which should shift the focus of regulators according to whether the blockchain has three layers, four layers, and what these layers actually do, why they're there, what's their purpose. Um, so yeah, that was just a, a summary. I'm not sure I completely answered to the question. But. Thank you, Rico, because we do have a couple of questions, and I know we're actually, <clears throat> even though we're one speaker down, we're, we're actually kind of ahead of time ourselves uh, already. Um, uh, just to kind of, there's a, uh, just in terms of Peter uh, Housen mentioned about electronic signatures, and he's quite correct uh, that I got confused. It's been a very long Zoom day today, I have to tell you. Um, and Neil Dance is posing a question about uh, our regulatory frameworks. Uh, how can they keep pace with the rate of change and development of new systems? I'm just wondering if anyone wants to come in on that at all. Could I, I, I make a very quick answer um, to Peter, which is, uh, I think he hits the nail on the head that the Law Commission report couldn't have been clearer. Yeah. But there's a difference between the Law Commission report and the law. So ironically, uh, the folks who were happy enough before the Commission wrote their report kept going. They didn't have an issue with it. Um, and the folks who weren't going to be happy until there was a change in legislation or a case, it didn't change their view. I think it's a, it's a perfect example of the stickiness here and it leads on probably to the second question about there are two track approaches because the um, the innovators will continue to push ahead mm. and those that are not comfortable with that won't so i think there are um, big questions here around traditional business models being uh, disrupted by more innovative uh, businesses in circumstances where the more innovative businesses just have a different view of regulation in the financial services sector you know, that the uh, the banks are uh, heavily regulated closely regulated they've had difficulties with their regulators from time to time it's very difficult for them to take a, an innovative mindset much as they do try they all have um, innovation hubs within the organization so i i think the the second question about regulatory um, uh, oversight and how that runs is is probably related to the point that the Gita makes of being clear on the aims that we have for, for the community mm. and what we do to support those uh, and it's it's very it's increasingly difficult I think to get a one-size-fits-all um, solution and that distinction between centralized and decentralized models is 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 a really difficult question it feels to me like we won't be able to avoid decentralization coming to large parts of the economy and we're not really ready for them we're not used to them um, younger people probably will be when they come through so we should for sure be, be checking in with them um, as regulators and policy makers to see what they make of it forgetting to unmute myself but uh, thank you Charles. I'm just conscious now that we're coming up against time and I, I just wonder if any of our panelists, panelists have got any final comments and, and maybe a final question I have about GDPR given that the UK is about to leave the European Union. I'm not saying any more than that. Um, if you have any uh, ideas uh, about where the UK goes in terms of its, its frameworks after the 1st of uh, January as we, uh, whether or not we have some type of trade deal. I've got to admit, as a legislator, it becomes extremely worrying that we're at this stage in one of the most complex negotiations in modern Western history, and we still don't have it, you know, we don't have a clue. So I'm just wondering if any of you have any kind of final comments on the future of GDPR in the UK. Quick ones, that is. <laughs> I think your guess is, is better than mine, Martin. I, I think the GDPR has been successful uh, so far as it goes and it's been as as has been noted a model for the rest of the world so there's been a significant benefit there we're talking this evening about a particular use case where it, it's a hard case for gdpr um, probably my overall comment would be don't make work for lawyers if you can avoid it <laughs> that can't be a policy aim 
I've not heard a politician who would ever disagree with that. Uh, Enrico, have you got any final comments on that? And then we'll come to Mohammed. Uh, what my comment would probably be the following. Uh, so when, when we try to apply some uh, piece of legislation such as GDPR to blockchain, we stress the cost of uh, decentralization. Uh, and we say that because of blockchain is decentralized, these pieces of legislation uh, do not fit well. My, common, my final comment will be the following. Uh, decentralization is not a structural feature of a system. Um, decentralization defines uh, interdependencies and dynamics between elements of a system. So a system that might look centralized at a moment in time might very well and very fast shift towards centralization and vice versa, because the way in which these various elements of the system interact uh, generate some form of centralization or not. So I think that the way in which we should look at decentralization is not an ex ante structural characteristic as a starting point and then frame legislation over that but see how legislation or the, context, the legal context in general can affect these dynamic interactions shaping centralization or decentralization. So it should be the ex post outcome rather than the exogenous ex ante parameter, let's say. Um, because I've, very often we say decentralization, but, um, but it's not an inherent or characteristic of a system. It, 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 something is centralized or decentralized depending on, on the dynamics and, and, and the aspects that, that are considered. Thank you. And I'm, before I'm, I'm going to go to Mohammed and then come quickly to Chris, because I think Chris Francis got a few comments. So Mohammed, over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I think um, um, it's the use case, which, uh, I mean, if you are talking about the blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology, the technology was there since 1989, 88. So it's the use case. So Bitcoin and Ethereum, they, they brought the hype and now the use case needs to be um, uh, regulated and, um, and the regulation uh, so sh should fall under the regulation. So if we look at the, what Mark Zugba said uh, about regulating content, it's more that he was, wasn't taking any responsibility. So it's more the ownership. So whatever, even if it's a layer structure system, it's on the first layer, second layer, third layer, there's an ownership. If there's an ownership, then you are responsible. So it's, it's like um, um, uh, one of the colleagues said that protecting citizen, enabling innovation, but under the law. So um, um, with regards to leaving EU and GDPR, GDPR um, gave us the power and protect our privacy. Now, most of the application which we have on our phones if you look at, I mean, uh, except like the big names, uh, there are many other applications, they don't even bother to put their offices in the EU, but now they are because we are under GDPR. And the good thing is that GDPR is mirrored across the other jurisdiction and it's create a, a kind of envir environment where the, the companies can uh, transfer data from one jurisdiction to another under GDPR, like Japan and India, they are all mirrored GDPR. So, um, I mean, if we leave that, then again, this is a question that how they're gonna deal with the, uh, in the UK, but um, it's more about, uh, uh, when we talk about decentralization, we are talking about the same concept which been adopted by uh, now by NHS uh, for the tracing app. So now they are following the decentralized model of Google and Apple, and they were doing, trying to do something and re uh, reinvent the wheel, but now, so decentralization is purely decentralization when it's come to the data subject, the consumer, and the more control we have um, and, 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 and the laws protect us. Um, so the technology and the use case, it's not about the technology itself, the blockchain should be regulated. It's about the use case and, and what the use case is for. So that's right. Thank you. And uh, uh, on the, the NHS app, luckily, from my perspective, we have a different NHS in Scotland. But anyway, on to Chris. I think he's going to come in. Yeah. OK, many thanks. Um, I think uh, I, I think this is a yes. I'm not suggesting you separate out the 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 you can separate out the deal, the application or the content of use that we're talking about in, in regulatory terms. 
I think it's worth pointing out um, um, the GDPR is very process orientated. Um, it, it really doesn't really cover that. And I, I think this is one area where it's worth going back and thinking about first principles. Is the data subject protected? In other areas, uh, cloud computing, for example, the ICO has been very good at issuing documentation on how to think about data protection in use of cloud computing. As, as a first port of call, seeing something like that for blockchain would be perfect. They've also got this idea of a regulatory sandbox, which is about applying regulatory constraint, restraint in, in areas of innovation as long as and with them engaged right up front, which as I said is a key issue for any regulator in this area, um, that, that they handle it. Uh, you know, a, a key issue, for example, is deletion. It is really hard to handle deletion in distributed encrypted data. There are ways you can emulate it, one way encryption where you can't get the data back. And there are occasions where ultimately the data might be private data, but it might be ephemeral and therefore go out of date. So. You know, there, there is the, 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 these areas, but uh, the other thing, I, you know, and, and hence all these contextual issues come into, I think, Bridget's point, clear objectives. It is very easy to get into technical debate and technical area and lose sight of, of our regulatory objectives. And, and by and large, I would come back to the fact that this is mostly about supporting our existing regulators. Yes, the big beast in this area will be the ICO, but let's not forget construction, banking, insurance, medical devices, all of these areas where it's actually much more obvious that, there are that this is a dual-sided issue. Yes, there are risks, but also it actually improves and makes the work of the regulator easy. Think about the application on, on food contamination if you've got a record of the food and every, every element of its path from, from farm to fork. These kind of issues. So, so, so you know, one of the issues we always suffer from when we start debating regulation and technology is we, 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 we focus on the negative. It is just as important and indeed just as, an, uh, just as much an ethical imperative to protect the positive and deliver the, 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 the benefits of technology to the consumer and, and, and the populace. Indeed. Thank you very much uh, for that, Chris. And without further ado, um, first of all, can I thank all our panellists, but I'm going to ask uh, Brigitte to say a few words because I know we've now come to the end of our evidence session. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to the CEO uh, to say a few words to our panellists and also to our advisory board and sponsors and all of you watching. So Brigitte, over to you. Thank you very much. This is definitely one of the hardest meetings to summarise. Uh, but uh, I do think that what we really got out of today too was to understand the complicated layers of uh, regulation on the blockchain. We have storage versus manipula manipulations, access uh, versus consensus. We have centralized, decentralized. We look at data uh, uh, and the GDPR and uh, leaving uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, so there are lots of areas, but I think we all also concluded that uh, use cases are extraordinarily important here uh, because we all need to understand the purpose of regulation. And then, of course, also the traditional uh, ways in which regulation is not to uh, have negative impacts on certain behavior. It is really about encouraging innovation, a competi competition, and networks and access and of course some ethical considerations and solving the problem and we have learned from different people today around all these things and we will have the report on this coming out soon and of course with the written evidence of the the from the Max Planck Institute who couldn't attend today because of network problems uh, I also want to say uh, um, that over the summer here, coming up, uh, we will be launching uh, the blockchain, a blockchain for government uh, council report. We all can remember we uh, launched the blockchain for government council. We've been working hard and on that report, and that is about uh, uh, the governance, blockchain governance uh, for smart cities. And uh, clearly, uh, I would like to thank you both, <laughs> Martin Douglas Hughes, and also Lord Chris Holmes 
for uh, really supporting the writing of these reports and supporting uh, access to uh, a lot of interviews around the reports. But that will be launched sometime over the summer. Uh, and uh, also we will, uh, in the next uh, few weeks, be launching a next couple of weeks will be uh, membership platforms in which we can all engage. And finally, here before the summer, I want to thank you all our sponsors uh, for the whole party parliamentary group on blockchain. Without uh, the sponsors, we couldn't have such uh, fantastic meetings uh, and great reports, uh, research behind and building the whole community. So thank you for all this. And of course, I'll hand over to Martin and thank you for chairing <laughs> the whole community. Well, thank you very much, Brigitte, and, and thank you to everyone at the Big Innovation Centre who does all the work behind the scenes that no one usually sees, uh, to the advisory board, to the members of the Commons and the Lords who are part of the official membership of the All Party Parliamentary Group. Uh, we've got a, a, an interesting summer ahead that no one ever thought they'd be living through. Uh, so I do hope at some point uh, after the summer recess we may be able to meet in Parliament, but I do hope there's still some element of the virtual because I think we've seen some really good engagement uh, from outside uh, of the Commons uh, in terms of people participating online, which has been uh, really uh, good to see. Uh, and uh, wishing everyone else have a, a lovely summer. Uh, and we're not through the woods, out of the woods with this yet in terms of COVID-19. So I do hope that you all stay safe and well and that you do get at some point of rest uh, during the summer itself. So. Thank you very much indeed, everyone, and we will see you uh, after the summer. Thanks again.